welcome to Forthright, Reader Feedback Edition. I'm Sulani Madsen. When I realized the significance of the date of my first regular Thursday newspaper column of the year, there was no ducking. I had to write a reflection on the mob breaking and entering at the Capitol in 2021. Here is my column, as published in the Spokesman Review on January 6, 2022. One year later, what's in a name? It's the anniversary of something, but we can't agree on its name. There is no common narrative yet for the events of January 6, 2021 in Washington, D.C. If your political bias leans left, it's labeled an insurrection and the worst attack on our democracy in history. If your political bias leans right, it was a nasty riot capping off a summer of riots. Regardless of your political lens, it was a horrible thing to watch. And President Trump missed an opportunity to be presidential when he ignored repeated pleas from family, friends, and political allies to call on the mob to stand down. The National Park Service issued a permit for 5,000 to 30,000 attendees for the January 6th Stop the Steal rally. One current estimate of the actual number is, quote, six times as many protesters, as many as 120,000, would show up on the mall on January 6th according to classified numbers still not released by the Secret Service and the FBI, but seen by Newsweek, close quote. The number actually entering the Capitol is cited as 1,200, quote, circulating in classified assessments made by the Secret Service and the FBI and obtained exclusively by Newsweek, close quote, and published December 23rd. Reuters news agency reported in August, quote, the FBI has found scant evidence that the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol was the result of an organized plot to overturn the presidential election result, close quote. Attorney General Merrick Garland affirmed no one had been charged with insurrection at a congressional hearing in October. The Washington Post reported as of December 31, a total of 725 individuals have been arrested. About, and this is a quote, 640 people were charged with entering a restricted federal building or its grounds, and another 75 were charged with entering a restricted area with a deadly weapon." Close quote. The only gun fired on January 6 was by a Capitol Police officer. While few firearms were confiscated that day, PolitiFact notes, quote, video plainly shows the mob using all manner of makeshift, makeshift weapons to attack police and force their way in, close quote and it is therefore correct to call it an armed mob. The same PolitiFact fact check from last February also says five people died. That is incorrect, but has not been updated. Contrary to early reports, the DC medical examiner later determined Officer Brian Sicknick died of natural causes, two strokes, with no sign of external or internal injuries. In a November analysis, factcheck.org lists only four deaths. Two were heart attacks at the protest prior to the riot, not a surprising statistic in a crowd of 120,000. One was a young woman originally reported as being trampled by the mob, but whose death was later ruled an accidental overdose of a drug which, quote, can be prescribed to treat attention deficit order and narcolepsy, close quote. The fourth fatality was Ashley Babbitt, shot by a Capitol Police officer as she climbed through a window. The officer was later cleared of wrongdoing. The 1% who jo chose to join the mob, knock over barricades, and threaten lawmakers are individually responsible for their actions. The 99% of the lawfully gathered crowd held a mostly peaceful protest and went home. The left narrative blames Trump's year of whining about a stolen election and the Stop the Steal rally for inciting the riot. When a politician says, quote, you can run the best campaign, you can even become the nominee, and you can have the election stolen from you, the crowd cheers. Or at least that's how USA Today reported the scene in May 2019 when Hillary Clinton was speaking in Los Angeles to a crowd of definitely not Trump supporters. She went on to say, quote, the press could not give up their addiction to waiting to see what Trump would do next, close quote. On this, I agree with Clinton. Trump won the Republican nomination in 2016 when the media handed him a giant megaphone. He wasn't expected to defeat Clinton. The result was half of Democrats polled in 2016 believed President Trump was not legitimately elected. Protests, both peaceful and violent, broke out and continued until Inauguration Day. Democrats organized a pressure campaign on electors to throw over the popular votes in their states, hoping to deny Trump the presidency. Congress appointed a special prosecutor and held hearings on election integrity. 
Claiming trouble ahead and before and after an election day is the new normal in federal elections. If your candidate loses, it must be suppression, fraud, or collusion. Trump's rhetoric and litigation is a continuation of this toxic new American narrative, but it doesn't excuse the 725 facing charges for acting stupidly on January 6. Trump had a duty to act and call for peace. He didn't. He has disqualified himself from running for public office again. But it wasn't the worst attack ever on our democracy. Lawyering up to challenge results in battleground states is less deadly than refighting the first battle of Bull Run. Or maybe it was the first battle of Manassas. The Union and the Confederacy never did agree on the name of the battle, which nearly destroyed the Republic in 1861. On January 6, 2021, we saw how easily a mostly peaceful protest can be the genesis of an out-of-control mob. Insisting on labeling it insurrection is an incitement to political division and civil war. Let's not go there again. The tone of most of that column uh, was deliberately chosen to suppress a motion to focus on the facts like Joe Friday on the old TV show Dragnet. But I knew whatever I wrote was bound to stir up reactions in both the letters to the editor and in emails directly to me. Interestingly, the emails were almost uniformly positive while the letters to the editor were, as one friend described it, a hornet's nest. A few excerpts from my email inbox. From Bill, a, a reason and factual account or report, if you will, probably the only sane thing in print on the matter. From Chan, a good one. You will get angry responses from both sides today because you were correct, fair, and reasonable, something the other writer is incapable of doing. From Stu, nicely done. After reading your offering this morning, I felt obligated to send a big thank you for your great perspective. Just a further note, in full disclosure, I don't consider myself right, left, or otherwise. Honestly, I guess I would fall into what many label a rhino, very conservative on the financial end and in the middle right on the social end. From Dr. J, who frequently writes, thank you for shedding appropriate light on the capital events of January 6, 2021. The mainstream media has taken the worst case scenario approach, but only selectively, ignoring similar occurrences by BLM groups around the country and that of an incited protest during appointment hearings for, for recent Supreme Court Justice nominee Kavanaugh. From Greg, a longtime friend, the most important sentence is in your conclusion, Trump is not fit for public office. I supported many of his policies, but the man is despicable, a narcissist incapable of compromise, and I fear he will run again and drag the Republican Party into further destructive chaos. Anyway, glad you're still at it and enjoy reading your column. I'm surprised they keep you bottled up on the opinion page, let alone allow Vestal's column to run as opinionated news at times. Thank you, Greg. Uh, really appreciate your feedback. From Melody, I rely on you to be a cool voice of reason. Thank you for today's column. From Tom, good article today. You will probably get some hate for saying he has disqualified himself for running for public office again. I agree with you. Uh, from Debbie, I appreciated very much having a well-written, fair article to read today. It helped balance out the un hysterical and unfairly written articles from so many others. You will no doubt hear more than a few unfriendly comments in the next few days, but I wanted you to know that I thought what you said was right on. There was one from Andrew who said, I usually like your columns, but today was ridiculous. The election was stolen. And I have to say that the emails directly to me are not uniformly positive. In fact, most people who are compelled to write feel compelled because they're unhappy with something, just like the, the many unhappy customers who are more likely to speak up than the, than the satisfied customers. Um, what I told Andrew is the 2020 election is over. We have no process for a do-over. The focus now is the future, and I'll take up election integrity and access in another column. Uh, there were quite a few letters to the editor, including some calling me out by name. David Randall of Spokane objected to both my opinion column and of the straight reporting, which clearly didn't agree with his interpretation of events. David says, How dare the Spokesman Review print an op-ed piece by Sulani Madsen whitewashing the events of January 6, as well as the front page article describing the violent coup attempt as a, quote, protest of the election of Biden, end quote. The actions of the insurrectionists on that day was an attempt to overthrow the government of the United States, orchestrated by Donald Trump in order to install a fascist government with himself as the authoritarian leader." End quote. 
David, if that was the purpose of the mob's actions, it was a pretty poor attempt, lacking both orchestration and leadership. Uh, he continues with more angry jabs, calling this a revisionist attempt to further the aims of treason and irresponsible journalism leading to the end of democracy. It's hard to take such wild accusations seriously. It is those who hold on to such anger on both edges of the political spectrum who are irresponsibly playing with fire, which could lead to the end of democracy. And a letter from my friend Jim Wavada, who isn't afraid to disagree and disagree publicly, publicly and still committed to keep the conversation going. And I'll share this excerpt. Madsen's apologist reinterpretation of the facts is a clear example of a stunned old school GOP conservative trying to rationalize the irrational traitorous behavior of the new Republican base. Well, Jim, facts are facts. I'll plead guilty to being an old school conservative. I'll even plead guilty to being stunned last year because I assumed the mob was made up of what some people think of as the old Republican base and a lot of folks who talk tough and just want to be left alone. But that stereotype doesn't hold. Uh, Robert Pape, a, a political science professor at the University of Chicago, dug deeply into the demographics of those 700 or so charged with various roles in the riot. The rioters were generally older, more likely to be employed, more likely to have a university of education, and unaffiliated with any militia style groups, not what the professor expected based on past experience with politically charged violence. It's fascinating reading, and I'll put a link on the Substack page. But the bottom line is, the attitudes generally present among the rioters are shared by only about 8% of the U.S. population. In its annual party identification poll, Gallup found 40% of U.S. adults identify as Republican or Republican-leaning. So, no, Jim, the, the angry rioters were not a majority, or I don't believe even the base of the Republican Party. And I promise if solid evidence of an actual planned coup makes it past the sensationalized, alleged stage, I'll write about it. And finally, my favorite contribution from Pat O'Leary from Spokane, who titled his letter, The Goat Herder from Edwall, presumably implying that disqualifies me as a political commentator. I'm sorry, Pat, if you meant to be insulting, you missed. If you meant to sound elitist, you succeeded. I'm quite content in all of my roles, including the blue collar side of agriculture. Shoveling manure and making sausage is great experience for digging into politics. Join me again on a future forthright. Join our live stream on January 19 at 5 p.m. for a conversation with community leaders pushing beyond politics. Often we agree on the problems, but critical to crafting good policy is honestly airing differences of opinion and experience. That's the goal, an honest exchange between the Red Squad and the Blue Squad, remembering we're all on the same team. Go Team USA!